bumblebees have a dark side that all too often goes unnoticed. And the underground life of the bumblebee is shrouded in mystery. They may be garden favorites, but they don't get a friendly welcome everywhere. Bumblebees have enemies, both small and large. If they have to defend themselves, they will, using their powerful sting. Challenge a bumblebee, you run a serious risk of losing. Now, follow a young bumblebee queen and her furry sisters as we unlock the secret world of bees. It's the end of winter. Each day grows longer and the sun regains its strength. As the snow and ice start to melt, the year's early blossoms open. Some insects emerge to greet these first warm rays of the sun. But where is the next generation of bumblebees, waiting to fly, drone, and buzz their way into the world? About eight inches beneath the snow and earth lives our bumblebee queen. Here she lies, hibernating until roused by the sun. The glycol in the bumblebee's blood stops her from freezing to death. This queen bee urgently needs real warmth to end her hibernation safely. Dizzy and tired, she tries to reach the light and warmth. It's been six long months since the start of her winter sleep, but now she's finally awake. Capable of flying at just a few degrees above freezing, our queen takes off. Crossing fields of snow on the lookout for blossoms and food. She's hungry and needs energy fast. But she's out of luck. Already weak from hibernation, she now has a much worse problem. If she doesn't reach the bank quickly, she'll die. Our bumblebee lives in the foothills of the Alps. The climate is harsh. Only a few bumblebees will survive their first days. A few hundred feet lower, the temperatures are milder. Here, the spring's explosion is already reaching its climax. And for the insects, this is a time of plenty. Butterflies that survive the winter like this comma, find nectar in the dwarf laurel's blossom. All around are willows with their yellow catkins. There are about 100 different kinds of willow trees. These catkins are one of the most important food sources for insects in the springtime. And honeybees dip greedily into their nectar. Back up the mountain to our bumblebee queen, spring has yet to arrive. 
The grass frogs may be in the mood for love, but not every animal can take the cold and damp, especially not the insects. Our queen survived her dive into the icy water. Her fur helped insulate her from the cold. Now, she has to get a glimpse of sun and energy-rich food. In the blossom of the eastern rose, she finds the energy source, nectar, which she greedily sucks out with her proboscis. Restored to full strength, she aims for her next goal, find a home for the coming season. Ideally, a burrow abandoned by another animal. Our bumblebee queen starts a long reconnaissance flight. She needs to find a hollow in the ground to build into a nest. Bumblebees breed in nests. If they find holes left by mice, birds, or weasels, they'll occupy them. Burrows like these are perfect for them. Ground squirrels live in homemade burrows. They don't like bumblebees. They know bumblebees have only one goal, to intrude into their nests. The rodents hate this rudeness, and they know how to counter it. They clog the burrow with themselves. The greater mouse weasel, or ermine, also likes to build little burrows in the earth. Faster than you could imagine, our bumblebee queen appears and senses an opportunity. But the ermine is watching. Back to the drawing board. Another possible shelter is a nesting box. But sometimes they're occupied. As in the case of this black red-tailed family. No room here, especially not for a lodger. This pair of blue tits moved into their comfortable home weeks ago. It's dry and tucked away. Perfect for the parents and their six youngsters. The entrance is small, just over one inch. An ideal size to keep almost all of the blue tit's enemies locked out. Our bumblebee queen happens by. Of course, she's attracted to the nesting box. The blue tit knows something bad is coming. The bumblebee seems hypnotized by the tiny hole and what's behind it. The blue tit races back inside the nesting box in order to keep her offspring safe. The blue tit ignores the danger of being stung and follows her instincts to save her brood. Bumblebees are formidable adversaries. They cling on tight.
our queen bee's failed once again. But luckily, she's not hurt. If she lost one of her wings, that would be the end. She needs to find a home right away. Without a base, our queen bee won't be able to breed. And she has to, to survive. This could be her last chance, a mouse hole. She buzzes around it for several minutes. Will she dare to explore further? Our queen bee makes a big decision. She enters a mouse hole. She seems nervous, seen by the fact that she's repeatedly cleaning herself. Mouse holes go down about eight to 12 inches. Only at the end will she know if this one's inhabited. Again, our queen seems to be out of luck. This home is fully furnished. She's lost her courage at the last moment. But now, the mouse has spotted her. Our queen bee's determination to find a home has pinned her head to head with an animal almost 100 times her size. Even still, our bumblebee's made up her mind to fight. She will not give up this time. Raising her leg is a clear sign. If you approach me, I will fight. The mouse retreats out of respect for the bumblebee's sting and powerful jaws. Now, the bumblebee takes her chance and enters the mouse's living room. Mice are worthy opponents, and to expel them from their own nest is a challenging task. This is a life or death struggle. Victory for the bumblebee. The mouse surrenders and abandons her home. After this strength-zapping battle, our victor needs to rest. She's now the proud new owner of a nest, giving her the opportunity to start her own colony. Nearby, a colony of tree bumblebees occupy an old nesting box. Having recently hatched tons of worker bees, they're one step further in their development than our queen. Their queen is the biggest bee inside, and she's enthroned in the middle. The numbers in this nest will grow into the summer until there are about 100 bumblebees. This is a small colony compared to honeybee hives which can house up to 80,000 bees. Back at her nest, our queen bee is in a hurry to produce offspring. She's prepared this honey pot. It's made of wax and filled with nectar. It's her food store when the weather outside is bad. Unlike their honeybee sisters, bumblebees do not make organized hexagonal honeycombs. Instead, they build tiny cups. After the cups are built, our queen bee places her fertilized eggs in the little prepared cups.
she puts five to 15 eggs in each container. In every egg, there's a larva. Within 20 days, the larva will pupate. Our queen bee is a surprisingly caring mother. Every egg is carefully treated. She checks the eggs to make sure they're not damaged and then seals the small bowls. Now, they can start to grow. Outside, spring is in full bloom. Countless buds are now open and lure all kinds of insects with their yellow pollen. This honeybee is enjoying her bath in dandelion pollen. Honeybees may be the quintessential worker bee, but bumblebees actually visit many more blossoms every day. Bumblebees have a unique way of taking care of their brood. Again and again, our queen huddles up to her spawn. She brings them up to a temperature of about 86 degrees Fahrenheit. About four to five weeks from the time she laid the eggs, the big moment arrives. The bumblebee offspring emerge as adults. At the beginning of its life, bumblebees are colorless and soft. Even their wings haven't unfolded. Safe in the nest, they dry out quickly. One after the other, the bumblebees emerge. They're all workers. Our queen's colony is steadily growing. During summer, her colony may reach 500. Now, the queen produces eggs and nothing else. She will not leave the nest again. Spring gives way to early summer, and the common lungwort is a magnet for all kinds of insects. But not everything here is what it seems. The large bee fly looks like a bumblebee at first sight, but it's not. This is a fly with an extremely long proboscis. This animal carefully cleans its proboscis and wings. Grooming is important for flying insects. An infestation of parasites could result in death. Bee flies have dense hair, like fur. They specialize in bumble blossoms, just like the bumblebees. Through mimicry, they have a massive advantage because they have few predators. Anything that looks like a bumblebee is less likely to be attacked while out looking for food and nectar. But there's more to come. Bumblebee flies. This kind of fly imitates the bumblebee's colors. Seen from a distance, it's almost impossible to tell if it's a bumblebee or a fly. Even the best camouflage can be useless. Nobody cheats this specialist, the bee eater. These colorful birds love to live in regions with a mild Mediterranean climate. They breed in clay and loess walls. And they like eating flying insects. The bee eater's name is their game. Bees are their preferred food.
catch bumblebees on the wing. They're extremely skilled in squeezing the insects to remove their stings. Prepared, chewed, and softened, bumblebees provide an excellent meal. An ornamental flower garden is not an ideal habitat for bee eaters, but it can be a great place for bumblebees if there are plenty of pollen and nectar-rich blossoms. Some gardeners aren't satisfied with the number of bumblebees they find on their land. For thousands of years, beekeepers have kept bees in hives to make honey. But only since the late 20th century have we seen the flight of the bumblebee coming from a box. These commercially raised bumblebees are highly controversial. Many conservationists argue that they are capable of spreading disease to wild native bumblebees. Despite these concerns, these portable colonies are widely used to fertilize millions of plants around the world. If honeybees work hard, bumblebees work even harder. They collect pollen up to 18 hours a day. That's a thousand blossoms, day in, day out. In greenhouses, gardeners prefer bumblebees to pollinate their plants. Today, we harvest tomatoes in greenhouses from March to October, thanks to all the bumblebees. Summer's in full swing, and our queen's colony progress is good. All the workers return with their pollen sacks full to the brim. This is a good sign. The pollen is stripped off into little storage containers made of wax. That deposited pollen and nectar will feed the whole colony. In the middle of the pulsating nest is our queen bee. Her duty is to produce eggs, more and more and more of them. High mountains are a barrier to many animals, but not for bumblebees. In India, bumblebees have been sighted at nearly 20,000 feet, and in the European Alps, they're often seen on glaciers. Many species are extremely resistant thanks to their fur. Take the buff-tailed bumblebee. This species creates colonies at an altitude of up to 9,000 feet. Bumblebees are found all over the Northern Hemisphere, but they prefer landscapes with temperate, cooler weather. High mountain meadows far beyond the tree line contain many insects, attracted by the vast variety of wildflowers. The alpine climate is cold and moist. Some species of bumblebees cope well in these conditions and stay forever. This grass bumblebee is one example. Many species of bumblebees are habitat specialists. For example, the mountain forest bumblebee. This species likes to be in very high and exposed alpine regions. The gray and white Dumbledore is a purely alpine bumblebee species. 
Besides its coloring, its special feature is its conspicuously rough coat. The Dumbledore is still a mystery. Her colony rarely exceeds 50 individuals. Living up here in the cold mountains is the result of a long evolutionary adaptation. Fur protects another inhabitant of mountain regions. Brown bears. Though his diet is mostly vegetarian, he also likes to look for insects. Even the biggest and strongest bear has one little indulgence, his greed for honey. It's in many books and fairy tales, and it's true. Hollow trees most likely house wild bees. Bears' noses are extremely sensitive. They can smell honey from hundreds of feet away. And it's not always honeybees that produce this enticing smell. Bumblebees' nests, too, exude a tempting scent of honey. Once the bear makes up his mind, he's unstoppable. Even stings to his head don't deter him. On the contrary, they spur him on. The big claws on his powerful paws are an excellent tool to tear apart an underground nest. The bumblebees face total destruction. must abandon their nest. grabs big chunks and swallows them whole. Along with the sweet nectar, he devours larvae, pupae, and bumblebees. This makes his feast even more delicious. waddles away, seemingly satisfied and unfazed by the bees. But several bumblebees have been caught in his coat. They take sweet revenge for the destructive interruption. Some bumblebee species are true specialists. They've taken adaptation to a new level. This 
is the monkshood bumblebee. It lives in the Alps, between 26 and 8,200 feet above sea level. It has the longest proboscis of all the European species. It uses it to suck up water from small puddles. Fights easily break out over the best sites. But this impressive drinking tool actually developed for a completely different reason. One that has to do with the flower, the aconitum, or monk's hood. There are several species of this poisonous plant in the Alpine region. It's not hard to see why the plant is called monk's hood. Take a closer look. The petals look like tiny hoods. The monk's hood bumblebee specializes in gathering nectar from these bizarrely shaped flowers. It has to climb over the flower's stamens to get to the nectar, which is at the opposite end of the flower. And even then, the bumblebee can only reach it thanks to its long proboscis. The monk's hood bumblebee drinks almost exclusively from these flowers, and vice versa. The monk's hood depends on this bumblebee species for pollination. It's a textbook case of co-evolution, where two species develop uniquely well-matched characteristics. Perfect synchronization. But it's also risky, because if one disappears, the other is doomed. Not all of these codependencies have been discovered, but it's a fact that among the bumblebee varieties, there are endangered species. And it is a fair assumption that their extinction could mean death for a number of unidentified flowers. In early summer, the meadows are a sea of flowers with cheerful splashes of color. These colors have only one purpose, to attract pollinators, like bees, bumblebees, and butterflies. But as summer reaches its peak, the luxuriant splendor begins to wane. Ears of grain now dominate the landscape. Red poppy and blue cornflowers have long since faded. Field borders are true sanctuaries during these meager times, when food supplies dwindle so drastically. Midsummer also brings the mowers and the sides. With the meadows cut, there are even less flowers for the nectar-hungry insects. But the meadows must be cut back, otherwise grasses gain the upper hand. These hay meadows are man-made landscapes, a cultivated coexistence of grasses and wildflowers. Farmers who practice near-natural farming have begun to mow their meadows in stages. This means significantly more work. But the insects that pollinate the flowers then have more time and opportunity to gather reserves. Meadows can be varied. They're home to hundreds of different plants and precious habitats for a variety of living creatures, some of them only visible under a microscope. When vast meadows are cut down in summer, the pressure of competition among pollinating insects increases dramatically. The more variety there is in the remaining green space and the denser the vegetation, the greater the number and variety of insects that can survive. Flower gardens with a large diversity of native plants 
are an important resource for times like these. They provide a steady supply of flowers until late summer, vital for nectar gathering insects. Urban communities are starting to develop more biospheres. In Austria's green cities, more than 70% of the surface area provides places for bumblebees to find new food supplies in the summer months. Even inner city parks and ornamental borders serve as vital filling stations for nectar. By August, dead bumblebees line the streets. Sensitive landscape gardening provides food supplies throughout the summer months, but now the cycle is reaching its end. A last lifeline is the late blooming silver lime. Their tiny yellowish flowers bloom until late August. Silver lime trees and their nectar are irresistible to hungry bumblebees. The flowers of the silver lime contain mannose, a kind of sugar that until recently was believed to be lethal for bumblebees. Mannose or no mannose, bumblebees love the silver lime's nectar. But the meager months of summer have weakened the insects and competition is fierce. The energy needed to reach the precious nectar exceeds the energy the bumblebees can extract from the flower. So they die. To survive, a bumblebee needs about 150 milligrams of sugar a day. It's the shortage of nectar at the very end of summer that kills so many bumblebees and makes them food for the ant population. However, there's another danger. The bee moth. Bee moths are a dangerous parasite to bumblebee populations. They eat the bumblebee's nest materials, stored food, and young bumblebee larvae. Once the bumblebee nest has been breached, pests like moths and mites have an easy time of it. Even though some bumblebee mites may be useful to the bees by cleaning the nest of dung and waste products, they can also create an infestation that spells doom for a bumblebee colony. When mites breed in mass, they damage the brood. Many bees are left crippled and incapable of flight. It's an ugly sight when the mites fix themselves to the neck of the bumblebee and start to suck. Bumblebees can't get rid of these parasites. Back to our queen and her colony. At the turn of the season, something has changed. The queen seems listless. The colony's in turmoil. Our queen bee tries quietly to retreat, but suddenly, mutiny breaks out in the ranks. Her own brood is attacking her. The queen is stung, bitten, and flayed. Until she dies. Our bumblebee queen survived the icy winter months, claimed a nest, and founded a colony, only to be killed by her own offspring. After six months of toil, she served her purpose and is disposed of. A merciless cycle of generations 
rules a bumblebee colony. Shortly afterwards, many large bumblebees appear among the workers of the colony. These are the new queens, hatched towards the end of summer to ensure the next generation. Now is the time to watch future bumblebee queens leave their underground nests on their maiden mating flight. Drones, the much smaller males of the species, wait for a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity. They follow the young females, hoping for a chance to mate. Mating lasts for half an hour or more, and one insemination is enough to enable the queen to start a new colony next spring after hibernation. Not all of them will get that far, though. Where bumblebees swarm, predators are never far behind. And the courtship is so intense that the bumblebees don't notice the approach of the praying mantis. Future queen or hopeful beau, whoever is caught in the mantis's spiked forelegs, is lost. The mantis consumes her prey completely. has finally arrived. Autumn crocuses, faintly reminiscent of spring's earliest blooms, are a last salute from the flower kingdom. But the days of the bumblebees, who now visit the autumn crocuses, are numbered. The promise of pollen lures the bumblebees to the last gentians, but their life has reached its end. Once the leaves turn, frost is just around the corner. When the leaves fall, so do the last of the bumblebees. The colors of autumn are deceptive. They no longer signal a source of food. These leaves announce the arrival of winter. Now, all the colonies die. Only inseminated future queens survive. They find hiding places underground, under moss and dead leaves, where they will go into hibernation for several months. When spring returns, the young queens will emerge again to establish new colonies and play their role in the endless cycle of nature.